మార్నింగ్ సార్ మార్నింగ్ సార్ మీనాక్షి ఆల్ డిడ్ వెల్ ఆల్ యువర్ సెమిస్టర్ ఎగ్జామ్స్ అండ్ ఆఫ్టర్ ద షార్ట్ బ్రేక్ 3 వీక్స్ లేటర్ వి ఆర్ వన్స్ अगेन వి ఆర్ రిజ్యూమింగ్ అవర్ జీపాట్ కోచింగ్ క్లాసెస్ సో వార్మ్ వెల్కమ్ వన్స్ अगेन uh we are since as technical issue for last 15 minutes uh students are joining so we will start immediately we will start the first session now i request dr t uma balamurugan to give a speaker introduction uma and uh, thank you na oh, ah uh, yeah very good morning to all it is a great pleasure for me to introduce today speaker my teacher to our student dr s agilandeshwari madam who is going to talk us about quality control and standardization of herbal drugs quality control and standardization is essential for ensuring that a herbal product are manufactured to a safe and consistent standard this webinar will focus on the quality control and standardization of herbal drug Dr. Ahilandeshwari Madam, she completed her UG in Periyar College of Pharmaceutical Sciences in Trichy in the year 1992 and a PG in 1996 in same institution. She was awarded PhD in 2007 at Tamil University, Tanjavur. Currently working as a principal, uh, Sinivasan College of Pharmaceutical Sciences, Samayaburam, Trichy. She has an illustrious career over 30 years in the academic area. She is an approved guide for PhD and form PhD under various universities. She is an actively involved in organizing conference, seminar and workshop. She has published more than 57 both national and international publications. She applied German Utility Patent internationally. She has attended more than 75 conferences. She received Best Paper Award for Oral Presentation in Texo Vitres at 2006. Received fund from AACT RPS 14 lakhs in 2011-2 and 2013. On behalf of PAI, MMC and IPGA Tamil Nadu branch, we welcoming today's speaker dr s agilandeshwari madam welcome madam let's start your session ma'am ah uh, yes uh, dr uma and then uh, mr saravanan and also thank the organizers uh, like uh, ipga and then pa uh, mmc for giving me this wonderful opportunity uh, madam uma uh, yes madam i have some sharing problem in my slide show sir i will uh, share the slide in your uh, whatsapp number uh, please you can make a sharing slides ah okay madam okay yes. madam welcome okay. ma'am welcome ma'am meenakshi welcome warm welcome to you thank you so we were starting my uh, talk uh, first of all i like to Uh, thank the participants and also the organizing committee uh, to uh, organize such a wonderful program like uh, the class feedback for in three uh, aspects uh, today my topic is um, standardization for uh, herbal drugs so is it for uh, very important in our uh, pharmacological Uh, like the indian system of medicines like ayurveda uh, siddha yunani and uh, other system of medicine indian system of medicine um, so uh, so why we are going to standardize the drugs for uh, herbals especially for herbals so first of all what is uh, she want to tell the about the what is herbs so it is nothing but uh, ruled plant material such as leaves grass the entire part of plants like uh, seed stems root bark rhizomes or other plant parts which may be entire fragment and uh, or uh, powder so these are all herbs so why it is called as herbs the entire part of the plant as well as 
a fragmented or powdered form that is called as herbs then uh, what are herbal drugs so drugs may be uh, it is uh, after processing of uh, such material it is called as drugs so like that uh, herbal drugs it is also it is a finished labeled product that can uh, that contain active ingredient such as aerial or underground parts of plant or other plant substitutes or combinations uh, whether in the crude state or as a planned uh, preparations so the after processing uh, the material that is called as herbal drug so what is herbs and what is herbal drugs so this is also the questions arise from the uh, in your g patch what is herbs and what is herbal drugs so then uh, how we are going to plan this so this is one of the hello is it audible to you participants yes madam please go ahead madam uh, it yes. is louder ma'am yeah ah uh, yes yes uh, standardization so so what is the term called as uh, standardization so it is the herbal drugs refer to confirmation of its identity and determination of its quality uh, purity and detection of nature of adulterants if any of present in the uh, materials crude drugs so standardization must to do the confirmation of its identity and determination of its quality and purity and detection of natural of adulterants by various parameters like um, if you are using morphology microscopy physical or chemical and biological observation so that is the standardization we need for the herbal drugs so standardization is used to describe all measures so which are taken during the manufacturing process and quality control leading to the reproducible quality it is also encompasses the entire field of study from uh, birth of plant to its clinical application so and also another one point of view uh, standardization is the first step for the uh, establishment of a uh, consistent so, so consistent it is nothing but the constituents of the biological activity then chemical profile or simply a quality assurance program for production and manufacturing so the first step is going to to establishment of active constituents of their biological activity or by simply a quality assurance program for production or manufacturing then uh, what is the strength of herbal in uh, herbal uh, drugs in india so how many uh, uh, medicinal plants Uh, that is used as and various uh, parameters totally 10000 species are um, identified uh, for the usage of various parameters uh, totally 8000 so the 8000 uh, medicinal plants uh, wise uh, 325 are in pesticides and uh, 425 numbers in gums and resins and dyes then 550 fibers are used as the medicinal uh, herbs 10000 for miscellaneous purpose others traditionally used then 3500 edible uh, medicinal herbs are used as an indian system of medicine and also 80000 medicinal plants totally uh, used in uh, uh, various medicaments in the herbal formulations in uh, ayurveda or siddha or yamani or uh, in indian system of medicine so 10000 species are uh, currently it is identified as Uh, it is used in the manufacturing of uh, preparations and extracts then uh, why we are going to standardize that is the need for standardization of herbal drugs it is recent years interest regarding survival of ayurvedic formulations of medicine so most of the ayurvedic medicines are prepared from herbs so in the global perspective there is a shift towards the use of medicine of herbal origin as the uh, dangerous and the shortcoming of modern medicine have started getting more apparent majority of ayurvedic formulations are uh, prepared from herbs so in um, cardinal responsibility of uh, regulatory authorities so like uh, drug control departments regulatory authorities to ensure that the consumers get the medication which guarantee purity safety potency and efficacy so these are all uh, must to uh, standardize the herbs 
this duty is uh, discharged by the regulatory authorities by uh, digestive following various standards of quality prescribed for raw materials and finished is it any problem participants hello ma'am konjam nadula break aachu marubadi ipo voice ungalku audible madam neenga pesunga yes, okay, continue pannunga uh, yeah uh, okay sir in pharmacopoeia controlling manufacturing formulae uh, through the use of formularies and manufacturing operations through statutory imposed food manufacturing practices gmp so that is to do the standard is need for standardization then uh, procedure for standardization of herbal drugs what are the procedure we have to follow to standardize the herbal drugs these are all in order to assure a constitutive and acceptable quality herbal products care should be taken right from identification and the authentication of herbal raw materials to the verification process of final product so what are the procedures have to follow the herbal drug standardization first of all uh first thing uh, authentication is must do for the standardization second thing physical parameters the third one is uh, quantitative and qualitative analysis then fourth one is microbiological contamination then uh, another one is pesticide residues and also heavy metal analysis so these are all must to do the standardization for herbal drugs so uh, one by one authentication physical parameters then uh, quantitative and qualitative analysis and microbiological contamination and uh, pesticide residue and heavy metal analysis so what is authentication so we want to know the drug or the part of the plant uh, uh, is taken for uh, the formulation so uh, so we have to uh, authenticate by the botany so it, it is from the taxonomical or uh, microscopical microscopical and histological analysis Uh, to identify the uh, authentication of the plant species or botanical verification by the uh, currently accepted latin uh, binomial name and synonym so these step involved in authentication are a uh, taxonomic macroscopic and microscopic studies so record should be maintained for stages of collection uh, part of the plant collector then regional status then botanical identity such as phytomorphology microscopical and histological analysis and taxonomical uh, taxonomical identity so these are all to must do the authentication so that is the accepted latin um, binomial taxonomy microscopic and macroscopic studies then physical parameters so physical test include organometric evaluation so uh, what are the things you are already you know that what are the physical parameters in herbs so to external characters like odor uh, then the taste appearance viscosity moisture content then ph and then the disintegration time friability hardness and the flowability and the sedimentation and the extract values and the ash values these are all uh, in your regular uh, practicals in the pharmacognostical subject so these are all the physical parameters to do the uh, need for standardization of herbal drugs then quantitative and qualitative analysis so how we are going to do the qualitative and quantitative analysis to analyze the uh, quantity how much we are uh, present in the uh, particular uh, selected part or particular uh, drug so chromatographing and uh, sophisticated modern techniques of standardization such as uh, spectroscopic evaluation spectrophotometry tlc hptlc hplc then nmr so the st students are uh, uh, going to do the project work in uh, pg and uh, phd works so must to do the analytical parameters like uh, nmr hplc and hptlc tlc for isolated compounds uh, as well as uh, the crude extract so comparatively you have to uh, compare uh, the crude drugs as well as the isolated compound uh, how much amount present in the uh, 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 given uh, or uh, your selected uh, 
one selected uh, drugs comparatively the marker compounds marker compounds is nothing but it is an standard one it is marketed available drug so that is the semi quantitative information about the main active ones or marker compounds present in the food drugs or herbal products so markers play an important role in the fingerprint of herbal drugs so now it is a fingerprint it is nothing but uh, the data are uh, obtained from the uh, instrumentation part so the fingerprint of the herbs so quality of drugs can also be assessed by the chromatography finger then microscopical quantity uh, contamination so this also must for uh, the uh, standardization of fruit drugs if any of uh, microbial contaminations is available in the uh, drugs or it is uh, much of moisture present in the uh, drugs uh, to form a fungal or bacterial or any of organisms to spoil the active constituent so you have to uh, do the microbiological contaminations before that uh, the development of formulation so it can be measured according to parameter or a method described in the ayurvedic pharmacopoeia or it is in our indian pharmacopoeia or herbal pharmacopoeia so referred is the ayurvedic pharmacopoeia or in indian pharmacopoeia or herbal pharmacopoeia so the microbiological analysis include uh, limit of e coli and moles total viable aerobic count total enterobic enterobic bacteria and their uh, count and then aflatoxin analysis so the limit of e coli and other uh, aerobic count and uh, enterobic bacteria are accepted for the uh, medicinal uses uh, beyond the limits to have some uh, problem to produce uh, any problem so you so have to um, estimate or you have to do the standardization of microbiological contamination in uh, pesticide uh, residues also one among the parameter for standardization of uh, for the uh, standardization of herbs so standard limit of pesticides have been set the who or the fao food and agriculture organization some common pesticides that cause harm to human beings are uh, ddt and bhc then taxatin and alprim etc should be analyzed so these are all the human uh, uh, beings uh, 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 any of uh, pesticides do harm harm to human so standard limit of uh, pesticides also uh, to determine then heavy metals so heavy metals also uh, to cause the some uh, toxic uh, um, um, uh, some toxicity producing some toxicity so the limit of uh, heavy metals are used to do the uh, medicaments so toxic metals such as uh, copper zinc manganese cyan and also some uh, lead and mercury to be analyzed in the uh, powder or in herbal drugs the analysis of metals that specification is to be taken in the into consideration if it is having in uh, more than the limits so to avoid the uh, particular drug for the uh, uh, formulations so then uh, my, uh, as usual uh, the we are using w guideline for uh, herbal drug standardization particularly uh, we are uh, standardization uh, procedures are followed by the who guidelines what are the guidelines given by the who uh, herbal drug standardization is massively widely the guidelines set by the who can be summarized uh, by the following parameters uh, reference to the identity of the drug reference to the identity of the drug that means you have to refer in one of the standard so the already we are uh, using allopathic uh, drugs uh, we are uh, uh, compare compare it, uh, comparative statement we are preferred uh, from the uh, genuine one or official one so to refer to the identity of the drug so then uh, uh, reference to the psychochemical characters of the drug and also reference to the pharmacological parameter and toxicity details and microbiological parameters and the radioactive contaminants either by any of already uh, having and literature is referred by the literature or by the pharmacopoeias or by the any of work carried out by the any persons uh, then uh, this is the standard uh, guidelines to given by the who then uh, how, how it is reference to the identity of the drug 
So then the phytomorphologically, so the botanical evaluation that is done by uh, identity by uh, phytomorphology and microscopically histological analysis. Why we are going to do the histological analysis in reference to the identity of the tree? So it is having a, a parts of plant uh, like uh, bark, leaves, and flowers, and any other part, uh, which one is richer than the active constants present. So by the histological analysis using the chemical uh, uh, reagent, uh, um, some uh, reactions are occurred by the colored uh, indications. So the rich of uh, chemical constants uh, by the reaction, so the rich part is for, for having an uh, rich of active constants to identify. So reference to the identity of the drug by the histological analysis. So you can section, sectioning the drug and add the chemical reagents to show the, it should be shown in the microscopy. So the in microscopical characters, if the xylem or phloem or any of uh, parts having a rich of uh, uh, active constants present in by the indication, by the color reaction. So you have to um, take the part of the plant which is uh, richer than, so you have to refer to the identity of the drug by the histological analysis, microscopically and Phytomorphologically. So, like um, cell balls, cell content, starch grains, calcium oxalate crystals, trigobes, fibers, and vessels. So, sensory uh, characters like fragrance, so foreign, and then foreign organic matter, histochemical evaluation, and quantitative measurements, etc. So, these are the reference to the identity of the drug and the reference to the pharmacological uh, property. So, Pharmacological properties reference uh, like uh, biological activity profiles. So that uh, bitterness and the homolytic index, astringency and the swelling factors and forming index. So then uh, these are all the parameters uh, for, uh, uh, it, uh, for uh, doing for uh, reference to the pharmacological property. And uh, physicochemical characters of the drug reference. Then uh, already you know that. What are the physical chemical characters like uh, chromatographic fingerprints, then uh, ash values, ecstatic values, moisture content, and volatile oil content, then alkaloid elastic, and some qualitative estimation protocols. Then uh, it includes uh, odor, then color, appearance, clarity, viscosity, moisture content, and then pH, disintegration. If it is having a formulation, so that uh, how to do the disintegration time and friability, then hardness and uh, flow ability and flocculation. These are all uh, for uh, formulated drugs. So the physical parameters include uh, the following things are to need the standardization. So like ash value uh, and settling rate. Chemical parameters include, uh, as you know, a limit test, the chemical, uh, chemical test and the chemical assays. So limit test for the comparative works, uh, test drug and standard drug. Then chemical test to identify the chemical constraints and the chemical assays, and then uh, uh, chemical assays are to, for uh, uh, separation techniques like alkaloid or any of glycosides or any of the tannins present to isolate uh, the chemical constraints uh, before the chemical uh, assays. So then chromatographic analysis of herbals can be done by the TLC, HPLC, uh, GC, UV, and the GCMS, and also the fluorimetry. Then toxicity types. So it has some uh, pesticides and heavy metals and uh, any of uh, microbial contaminations to producing a toxic uh, to the uh, patients. So that uh, you have to do the toxicity details by the determinations. Pesticide residue, uh, some analysis of heavy metals, and do the microbiological contaminations, pesticides residue contaminations, and also microbiological contaminations procedures, and uh, some uh, to find out the uh, limit of E. coli, salmonella, and another, uh, some other uh, organic uh, Then microbiological parameters. So as usual, that is we are using qualitative and quantitative or semi-quantitative total to ascertain and control the amount of impurity like reagents used during abstractions of various herbs and impurities coming directly from the manufacturing vessels and from the solvent. So these are all the parameters for uh, 
uh, microbiological study. Then identification of medicinal plants. So how to identify the medicinal plants? So what are the steps to do, to do the identification parameters? So first step and uh, for uh, searching up uh, for uh, search for official and the vernacular names of the drug. Then formulary. So what is formulary? What is, uh, nothing. It is nothing but what are the reference uh, uh, we are uh, uh, having uh, reference books, official books. So that is the formulary. So then first step is search for official and vernacular name of the drug. Then formularies are monographs and pharmacopias. Then second steps uh, list the possible adulterants and substituents are present in the uh, drug. Then uh, then refer in the pharmacopoeia and other uh, uh, controversial drugs like uh, books by Balvan Singh, etc. So other books refer in the other official books. Then third step is taxonomical identity of the crude drugs for reference. So any taxonomical uh, reference. So uh, any authors uh, described in the taxonomy. So it is what is the taxonomy of uh, so like uh, genus, species, and uh, other things. Taxonomical identity of progress for reference. Uh, like you have in the reference of herbarium or drug museum or in the collections, any of collections. Then fourth step, pharmacognostical identification of official adulterants or substitutes. So pharmacognostical uh, standardization. So pharmacognostical identification uh, by the botanical and physicochemical and chemical identifications. Before that, uh, uh, entering into the formulation or in the uh, research work or in the projects. So you are uh, doing the identification of medicinal stuff in the above uh, for the following steps are followed for the identifications of medicinal plants. So the finally, Fourth step is form a cognitive identification of official adulterants and substituents by the botanical, physicochemical, and chemical identifications. So, what are the identification of crude drugs? So, systemic study of crude drugs. So, already you have studied in third year pharmacognosy and fourth year pharmacognosy and the PGs in first year semester. Systemic study of crude drugs and microscopic identification and the determination of stomatal index. Then determinations of pain islet number. If the uh, drugs having a uh, leaf in the form of leaf, so we have to do the uh, stomatal index and the vein, vein islet and uh, vein terminations number. The systematic study of crude drug, uh, which are used to do uh, natural form, in it is, that is called as crude drug. So the, already I have uh, explained it the uh, beginning of the uh, lecture of uh, of my lecture. So what is drug and what is food drugs? How to uh, form the term of uh, pharmacognosy? Already you know that in pharmacognosy, a complete uh, systemic study of food drugs is, it is comprises of uh, origin, uh, common name, scientific nomenclature, uh, geographical source and uh, history, cultivation collection, preservation and storage, then macroscopic, microscopic and uh, sensory characters, chemical composition, then identity, purity, Thing and assay, then substitute and uh, adulterants. In microscopical characters, as usual in your uh, syllabus, uh, for size and shape, outer surface, inner surface, then uh, area referred to, the only done in the plant parts are availability and air conditions. Then sensory uh, and organoleptic characters to uh, for uh, either it is volatile substances or uh, any other possible substances uh, by the sensory or organoleptic characters. So if the color, uh, odor, uh, taste are differ, uh, differ from the nature, so it is having then toxic substances present. It can be identified by the chemical and uh, microchemical test. So if I say, for example, strychnine present in the Naxomica uh, gives a purplish red color with ammonium vanadate and concentrated sulfuric acid. So this is the chemical uh, test done by the uh, any of uh, chemical substances present. Then microscopic identification. So it is uh, essential you that by the uh, sectioning part of uh, 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 microscopic evaluation identifications using chemical reagents. Then uh, method of uh, examining crude vegetable drugs. So it is classified into five types. Uh, first thing, uh, leaf and flowers. And the uh, second one is the entire uh, material powder. 
because uh, as such the entire material powder so it is either in the part of leaves and uh, flowers roots and seeds then roots and rhizomes and bulbs so type of stomata so it is also in your syllabus so what are the type of stomata uh, present in the uh, basically is is it uh, identified by the quality control test for herbal drugs for the especially for leaf constants either it is anamocytic or anisocytic or either parasitic or dietetic uh, uh, type of this is also one of the uh, procedure for standardization of leaves leaf constants then uh, this is the procedure for stomatal index so uh, how to determine the stomatal index it is by the number of stomata present and the number of epidermal cells it is multiple with the uh, 100 so this is the formula used to determination of stomatal index then how to determine the palisade ratio so how many is uh, epidermal cells uh, palisade ratio in the average number of palisade cells under one epidermal cell say for example here uh, the above pictures the palisade ratios are 18 by 4 the result is 4 uh, 4 4.5 so it, it is uh, also referred in the uh, standard one so if it is uh, uh, beyond the limit or within the limit uh, if how to standard it so uh, the uh, results will be taken by the reference so determination of pain highlight numbers so this is also to standardization of uh, leaf constants so how to standardize the determination of pain highlighted i will be share the slides in your uh, group of uh, participants then uh, quantitative study of two drugs so what are the already time is over so have to rush up the procedure so quantitative study of two drugs sampling uh, these are by the following parameters one is the sampling of two drugs then determination of foreign matter determination of total ash and determination of acid insoluble ash determination of water soluble ash determination of moisture content and also to uh, find out the volatile oils in drugs and also the solubility of uh, uh, extract uh, solubility of active constituents in uh, alcohol soluble extractives and water soluble extractives then uh, ether soluble extractives then estimation of starch grains and the estimation of sugars and all the also to determine the foaming index and also protein uh, estimation and uh, fat oil fatty oil estimations then chromatographic techniques so thin layer chromatography to identify the uh constituents uh, present in the drugs then limit test also to identify the any of uh, uh, heavy metals or in the limits uh, beyond the limits or above the limits uh, then uh, within the limits then micro microbiological limit test and pesticide residue and aflatoxin test for aflatoxin then sampling of uh, drugs so how to test the uh, sample taken by uh, for uh, formulation uh, original sample how to uh, uh, check the original sample the total weight of the drug to be uh, sampled is less than 100 kg at least 250 grams are withdrawn to constitute an original sample then uh, test sample so comparative statement original sample and test sample so how to compare uh, what are the uh, sieves are used for the passing of uh, drugs then foreign matter and its determinations so foreign matter nothing but any of contaminations uh, if it is present any foreign matter so automatically to uh, demolish the abnormal odor uh, having some uh, uh, no abnormal odor and discolorization slime or sign of determination uh, deterioration should be detected so medicinal plant material should be entirely free from visible signs of uh, contamination by insects and other animal contaminants so say for example uh, sample size uh, so root rhizomes and bark so it is a uh, sample size is uh, 500 grams uh, leaves flowers seeds and fruits are 250 grams the foreign matter should be detected by the inspection with the uh, unaided eye or by the use of a lens uh, separate and weigh it and calculate the percentage present so any other foreign matters present and its uh, uh, percentage determinations of total ash so already you know that how to determine the total ash what is ash 
so ash it is nothing but without a carbon that is called as ash to find out the uh, ash value total ash then acid insoluble ash and also acid soluble so various uh, uh, ashes are uh, determinations of ashes are in official pharmacopoeia so the total ash method is designed to measure the total amount of materials remaining after ignition so this include both uh, geological ash and is derived from the plant tissue itself and the non geological ash which is the residue of the extraneous matter example sand and soil so adhering to the plant surface so if it is uh, present in any of other contaminating product or any other uh, additional uh, so like uh, soil and uh, sand or uh, if it is uh, present in the ashes so the percentage are varying uh, for the total ashes so determination of acid insoluble uh, so you are using uh, dilute uh, hydrochloric acid and uh, with the uh, substances igniting the remaining of insoluble matter is measure the amount of silica present especially as sand and silica uh, siliceous earth then uh, determination of water soluble ash so how much amount of soluble in the water then water soluble ash is the difference in weight between the total ash and the residue after treatment of the total ash with water so this is the water soluble ashes then moisture content so how much uh, some of uh, uh, so why we are doing the moisture content to avoid the deterioration of the drugs so or uh, any contamination factor in the uh, product products or in the food drugs so an excess of water in medicinal plant material will encourage microbiological growth uh, the presence of fungi or insects and uh, uh, deterioration uh, following hydrolysis so limits for water content should therefore be set for every given plant materials especially important for materials that absorb moisture easily or deteriorate quickly in the uh, presence so some of uh, uh, to avoid the uh, deterioration of the uh, chemical constituents then uh, determinations of volatile oil tracks so how to determine by the um, distillation method so volatile oils are characterized by their odor so aromatic principles having substances are uh, containing volatile oils so like uh, pepper then uh, uh, spices so so is automatically cloud so these are all contains the volatile oil substances so characterized by their odor oil like appearance and ability to volatilize at a room temperature chemically they are usually composed of mixtures of for example Uh, mono terpenes and sesqui terpenes and their oxygenated derivatives so especially for uh, mono terpenes and sesqui terpenes and their oxygenated derivatives then aromatic compounds predominate in certain volatile oils because they are considered to be the essence of plant materials they are often biologically active they are also known as essential oils how to differentiate the volatile oils from essential oil so it is aromatic compound predominant in certain volatile oils because they are considered to be the essence of the plant materials that is called as essential oils it is having an biological often biological active principle so the determination of volatile oil in a crude drug made by distillation so it is done by the distillation method um, uh, uh, then uh, mixture of water and glycerin so why we are using uh, glycerin in the uh, determination to avoid the uh, evaporation of volatile oil to preserve preservation of volatile oil or avoid the volatilization uh, by adding glycerin so collecting the distillate in a graduated tube with which the aqueous portion of the distillate is automatically separated and returned to the distilling glass and measuring the volume of the oil so the content of the volatile uh, volatile oil is expressed as a percentage one. so volume by weight so how much amount of uh, uh, drug is taken and how much amount of volume uh, is obtained so it is expressed as the percentage volume by weight so this is the determination of volatile oil then uh, water soluble and alcohol soluble ether soluble extractives we are using uh, alcohol ethanol or uh, ethanol so now they are uh, uh, not allowed for the uh, extraction of methanol is not used so ethanol 
alcoholic soluble extract how much amount is soluble uh, by using uh, alcohol and how much amount is uh, soluble in the uh, ether so that is the percentage uh, that would remain the extractives alcohol soluble extractives and ether soluble extracting using uh, uh, alcohol and ethers so why we are going to do this the extractive volume indicates the addition of exhausted materials and adulteration or incorrect processing process during drying or storage or fermentation so during uh, drying and uh, during processing and uh, during storage so some of uh, uh, active constituents are uh, exhausted so that uh, that is uh, the after uh, uh, drying or uh, storing or during uh, processing Uh, after formulating the drugs, it's not uh, okay, having uh, such amount of uh, ex uh, active constituents. So why it is occur in this? So before processing, we have to do the alcohol soluble extractive. So how much uh, the active constituents are in uh, um, percentage compared to the official one? So is it in the uh, within the limit or beyond the limit? So after uh, Uh, processing the water soluble extractive or uh, water and alcohol soluble extractive so before the formulation and all as well as ether soluble extractive like that so starch and sugar estimation so content of starch grains so to uh, determine the uh, starch grains by the uh, analysis is a technique that is useful for uh, determine plant taxa so why we are going to do the starch and sugar estimation is to determine the plant taxa so according to the uh, peculiarities and to the origin of the plant material so the, the size and shape and structure of grains from plant species various uh, various little and can be lead to identify and uh, forming index so this also you have no so if having some materials uh, to produce a foaming it is also uh, Um, for uh, making some formulation difficulty, so that uh, how to do the foaming index before that uh, entering into the formulation. Many medicinal plant material contain saponins, so which constituents uh, are producing uh, foam. Uh, so particularly the saponins to produce the foam uh, that can cause the persistent the foam uh, when the aqueous decoction is shaken. so the forming ability of an aqueous decoction of plant material and the extract is measured in terms of the forming so that uh, so some um, difficulties producing in the formulation so that uh, how to do the uh, forming index before that uh, formulation so as well as the protein estimation is also uh, doing for standardization of herbal index so the procedure is having you can go through the procedure after uh, uh, sharing of slides uh, to the group then fatty oil estimation it is it is nothing but to estimate fatty oils uh, extract accurately weighed uh, air dried powder plant materials with petroleum meter in sulfuric apparatus the dry the extract over anhydrous sodium sulfate and remove the solvent under vacuum at 40 degrees centigrade then after uh, uh, drying A removal of a solvent uh, weigh the residue and calculate the percentage with reference to the plant material used so that is the estimation of fatty substances so it is uh, within the limit or beyond the limit of the uh, reference to the official one then chromatographic technique thin layer chromatography it basically it is uh, identify the particular active constituents so tlc is particularly valuable for the qualitative determination Um, a small uh, amount of impurities so for uh, um, identification of the impurities present in the uh, active constituents uh, it is a technique in which the solute undergoes uh, distribution between two phases stationary and mobile phase already you know that what is in layer chromatography then limit test so limit test also you know Uh, studied in uh, b pharmacy basic uh, inorganic chemistry and uh, pharmaceutical analysis so it is also to uh, yeah quantitative or semi qualitative test uh, designed to identify and control uh, small quantities of impurities which is likely to be present in the substance so limit is generally carried out to, to determine the inorganic impurities in the compound so why we are going to do the 
limit is uh, particularly for uh, herbals. The inorganic impurities present in the compound. So, actually, they so have to determine the inorganic compounds present in the compound. So, permissible limits of chemicals. So, what are the limits available? Uh, permissible uh, limits, uh, say, for example, lead, arsenic, cadmium, and mercury. Permissible limits are uh, limit, uh, as uh, given in the table. You can show it. Then, uh, microbiological limits. So, the microbiological limits are designed to perform the qualitative and quantitative estimations of specific viable microorganisms present in the sample. Then microbiological contamination limits are given in the table if either uh, present or absent or how much it is present. Then pesticide residues. So already you know, uh, uh, in the previous procedure I will explain, I have explained to you. Then maximum limits of pesticide residue for uh, medicinal plants. So as given in the table, Say, for example, uh, aldrin and uh, daldry. So, 0 0.05, like uh, chlorophyrophose, 0 0.2, and chlorophenevinphose, 0 0.5, like that. The test for aflatoxin. So, aflatoxin is necessary uh, to do the uh, standardization. So, uh, produced by the common fungi. So, it is by the common fungi, aspergillus uh, favors and the closely related species, Asparagus, uh, Parasiticus, uh, have the limits are uh, B1 and G1 is 0 0.5 parts per million. Then physical test and determinations. So physical test and determinations are given uh, as well as follows. Powder uh, fineness, specific gravity, determination of pH value, viscosity, saponification value, and iodine value. These are all for the determinations uh, for uh, physical determinations, especially for uh, any of fat and vacuous. Then uh, powder fineness. So how to find out the uh, fineness? What are the sieves used for the uh, coarse powder, fine powder, then very fine powder? So the different sieves are available. Moder uh, coarse powder, moderately coarse powder, moderately fine powder, and fine powder. So what are the sieves used to uh, separate the different type of powder? So, by the uh, percentage used, then uh, what are the sieves used to uh, separate the uh, coarse powder, moderate coarse powder, moderately fine powder, and then fine powder? You can see the uh, sieve sizes and then number of sieves available. Then, specific gravity. So, already you know that weight per ml. So, specific gravity, any of oil substances you are taking for uh, formulation, you have to do the specific gravity test. Uh, for uh, making standard. So then pH value also must do for uh, the any uh, alkalinity or acidity uh, more than the uh, more than the values available uh, for the uh, substances. So you have to do the uh, pH value for uh, uh, herbal drugs. So if uh, represents the acidity or alkalinity of the aqueous solution in the pharmacopoeia. So you can compare uh, with the official uh, pharmacopoeias uh, to refer the standard. Then discuss. So any of the substances used in the formulation, you have to uh, standardize the uh, 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 parameter for using uh, viscous. Then saponification value as usual. So any saponification for reducing substances is available or to make a fat or oil uh, to conversion of oil uh, beyond the limits uh, to spoil the formulation. So you have to uh, measure the spinification values. Then iodine value, peroxide values also as like that. And then transiridity test also. Then chemical test and assays. So especially for estimation of total phenols, estimation of total tannins, and uh, determination of aluminum, borax, calcium, copper, iron, magnesium, mercury, silica, and sodium chloride. So these are all must for uh, for the chemical test and assays uh, for uh, before formulations or uh, any of standardization of herbal drugs. Then uh, finally, I conclude that uh, uh, the overall uh, development and uh, developing uh, world's uh, home remedies 
in over the counter drug products and as raw materials for the pharmaceutical industry and they represent a substantial proportion of the global drug market so it is essential to establish a standard guidelines for assessing the quality so in order to establish the standard guidelines like who uh, is recommended that various government agencies should follow a more universal approach to herbal quality and also developing monographs so then uh, for the purpose of research work on standardization of herbal formulation yeah profound knowledge of the important herbs found in india and widely used in ayurvedic formulation is of utmost importance even when the chemical composition of a plant extract is known the pharmacologically active moiety may not be environment climate and other things so that uh, uh, herbal drug standardization is, is massively wide and deep so there is uh, so, so much to know and so much seemingly uh, contradictory there is on the subject of herbal medicines and its relationship within the human physiology and the mental function so so i uh, would like to thank all the uh, participants for uh, listening to the page thank you so much so any questions arises from the uh, participants madam over to uma madam and saravanan sir thank you madam thank you so much Uh, yes, uh since we are due to technical issue we started a little late so if any question and answers or any queries from the participants we'll directly uh, send to you ma'am so that you can call uh, collate and then you can uh, put it in the group ma'am ah uh, yes sir yes sir sure about it okay so uh, it is a nice presentation madam excellent yes, congratulations on behalf thank of uh, organizing committee we are thanking you for all your uh, value time and your uh, knowledge and then efforts ma'am thank you so much ma'am okay, and your for participants also ma'am uh, thank you so much ma'am it is excellent uh, from ppt also thank you ma'am i also thank share one more on the group you can just check yeah herbal uh, yeah. who yeah hi uh, yes madam yes madam that was very clear thank you thank you yes madam thank you so much thank you madam in fact ma on the day to day dial club we have been me uh, seeing all lot of remedies home remedies and then herbal medicines and being a pharmacy graduate uh, so we need to understand the lot of herbal medicines and then herbal product product uh, quality control as well as standardization it is a vast subject but you put it in a very natural la potu easy a pudira mari explanation kodutinga thank you so much ma'am participants vandu romba appreciate pandranga ma'am a very a very crucial time sir uh, we will uh, take two hours for this topic I will uh, <laughs> make it as a fast for the presentation. <laughs> I understand, madam. Due to time constraints, uh, we could not able to do much. But uh, only thing then within the time frame, you have explained it very nicely, madam. Thank okay, you so sir. much, ma'am. Thank you, thank you so much. And thank you, madam. Thank you, madam. So much wonderful session, madam. Very much superb, madam. Our dear class attend, madam. Very very super. Very much, madam. So you are all my students and uh, guys. Uh, Uh, thank you so much sir thank you so much mm, for given this wonderful opportunity yeah one decade i will take the pharmacognosy subject <laughs> before uh, uh, after uh, taking my principal uh, job i am the mm. first presentation for uh, ipt and uh, along with uh, uh, pa mft thank you thank you so much for your uh, committee and uh, ipt thank you madam thank, thank you madam okay thank you so Can much I... once again madam yes ma'am okay Can I leave this? Yes, ma'am. Yes, Thank yes, you, ma'am. So you can leave, ma'am. Uh, dear participants, please be stay on, and we will be uh, uh, shortly start starting our second session. Now, <coughs> madam, sorry, madam, madam, are you there, uh, sir? Uh, Kanan sir, sorry, madam, madam, the panelist are talking. Meanwhile, I will, I will now under speaker introduction. Put that, right? Sir, our name is not working. So, let me check. One second. Uh, let me just check. ஏன்னா நான் பார்த்துட்டேன் 
Uh, she has a more than a decade experience in teaching. She is not only having a PG degree in uh, pharmacy. She has also done a master in business administration in human resource. Also, she has done a PhD in the pharmacy department. She is not only uh, updating her knowledge in pharmacy field through attending seminars, conferences, symposium. Also, she disseminates the knowledge to all the uh, pharmacy students as well as through uh, alumni, through the GPAT coaching classes and various bodies. She has a very, uh, very good, very passion in uh, teaching. More than 11 years, she has experience in teaching and uh, she has uh, guided a lot of PharmD students as well as postgraduate students. And uh, her teaching methods are very, very innovative. That is the reason uh, in, in Indonesia, she has an international award in Innovative Teaching Faculty Award, which is known as Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam International Innovative Faculty Award 2021. She has got a lot of awards, accolades uh, in, the, uh, in India as well as international. So now let's welcome Dr. S. Arumadi to the GPAT coaching class. And our second session is Kaam. Pathophysiology of common disease. Every day we come across a lot of common disease like cold, fever, and a lot of diseases, infections, and all those things. So she will explain all this uh, common disease sort of pathophysiology. So now, the, now over to you, ma'am. You can start the uh, session. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, I would like to, it is my privilege to thank uh, IPGA team and uh, Serum College of Pharmacy to, uh, to be a part in this uh, GPAT online classes. And also I thank Jake Mari ma'am for uh, me to involve in uh, GPAT online classes. So I would like to uh, uh, start with the topic pathophysiology of common diseases. Thank you, ma'am. Welcome, ma'am. Thank, uh, welcome, ma'am. Thank you, so Welcome, much. madam. Can I just uh, put it in a slide, sir, ma'am? Uh, I have made it a slideshow, sir. Okay, ma'am. Is it visible, sir? Hey, it is visible, madam. Just put it in a big screen, madam. Is it visible, sir? Full screen? Uh, it's not, ma'am. For me, it is not coming. It's not coming in a full screen view. Ma'am, I'm going So now I would like to talk about this uh, pathophysiology of common diseases. So according to the GPAT syllabus, these are the diseases coming under uh, uh, GPAT syllabus. There is Parkinsonism disease, then schizophrenia, depression and mania, stroke, hypertension, angina, myocardial infarction, congestive heart failure, atherosclerosis, diabetes mellitus, peptic ulcer, cirrhosis, alcoholic liver disease, acute and chronic renal failure, and asthma and COPD. So all these diseases are coming under the GPAC syllabus. It is not possible to complete all these topics in one hour. So maximum will try to complete a few diseases. So first we'll uh, see about the idiopathic Parkinson's disease. So it is nothing but a degenerative progressive disease affecting the basal ganglia. The basal ganglia. So it is, uh, it is affecting the neurological system. So it is uh, mainly characterized by the movement disorder. You can see in the picture how uh, the patient is having the tremors. He's having the dyskinesias as well as tremors are seen in his hands. Okay, so it is characterized by the akinetic uh, rigid syndrome. That is, it is nothing but the slowed movement and increased tone in the muscles. And dyskinesias, that is uncontrollable movements will be seen. Essentially, tremors, chorea, myoclonus, and tics will be seen in this patient. So myoclonus is nothing but the muscular jerks. And if you take chorea, it is nothing but the involuntary jerks that happens in the shoulders, hip, and as well as facial region. And tics is nothing but involuntary movements in the facial region, that is the tics. So there is dyskinesias as well as akinetic rigid syndromes, which are often seen in the Parkinson's disease. 
you can see that uh, pathophysiology uh, that is in the substantia nigra region that is it is highly concentrated with the dopamine producing neurons so what happens is there is loss of dopamine producing neurons in the substantia nigra region and uh, this substantia nigra regions regulates the muscular movements so when there is loss of dopamine neurons uh, dopamine producing neurons from this region what happens there is decrease in the normal movements so it is leading to the irregular movements as well as slowed movements you can see the clinical manifestation how the patient looks like there will be tremors in the facial region in the shoulders uh, as well as you can see that there is a stooped posture the posture is being flat okay there is a somewhat uh, bent so stooped posture is there and rigidity of the muscles will be seen and also there will be flex uh, the knees will be flexed hips and uh, knees are slightly flexed and there are tremors even in the hands in the limbs region mainly in the upper and the lower limbs you can find the tremors so this disease it is characterized by presence of tremors involuntary uh, movements and also you can see that there is dyskinesia slowed movements and also muscular rigidity so these are the features of the parkinson's disease so coming to the treatment of parkinson's disease there are different class of drugs we'll be seeing that uh, uh, the classes okay so drugs affecting the brain dopaminergic uh, system so mainly the drug of choice will be the l dopa drug so l dopa is nothing but the it is a precursor of the dopamine molecule it is the precursor of dopamine why we are not giving directly dopamine means dopamine doesn't cross the blood brain barrier so what we are going to do is we are going to give a precursor molecule l dopa so which will, which will cross the blood brain barrier and it will be increasing the dopamine level so our drug of choice will be the dopamine precursor molecule which is l dopa so along with l dopa we will be giving the peripheral decarboxylase inhibitors so the drugs coming under this class is carbidofa and benzodiazepine okay so carbidofa is a peripheral decarboxylase inhibitor so what does it mean means when you are giving l dopa the in the peripheral circulation itself it will be converted into dopamine before reaching the brain in the peripheral circulation itself it is getting converted into dopamine so in order to prevent that conversion what we do is we give this this carbidofa along this carbidofa is given along with the l dopa so, since it is inhibiting the decarboxylation okay so it is inhibiting the peripheral decarboxylase enzyme and also prevents the conversion of dopamine in the peripheral circulation and other class of drug is dopaminergic agonist so we'll be giving ergot derivative and non ergot derivative so they'll be act, they'll be going and acting on the dopamine receptors and increase the level of dopamine so ergot derivatives are bromocriptin and pergolide when you take non ergot derivative propinerol and pramipexol all these are non ergot derivatives so it is activating the dopaminergic receptors and thereby increase the levels of dopamine next class of drug is maob inhibitors so uh, selegilin rasagilin so all these drugs are coming under maob maob inhibitors class you can see in the picture that M, uh, uh, once uh, the, the dopamine is reaching the brain what happens it is again metabolized into dopac and the 3mt it is converted into dopac and 3mt dopac is nothing but dihydroxyphenyl acetic acid and the 3mt is nothing but the 3 methoxy tyramine so dopamine is metabolized to these compounds so we should we, we require more amount of dopamine once dopamine is broken down what will happen then again the dopamine uh, levels will reduce so we are giving a maob inhibitors which will be inhibiting that enzyme that this enzyme maob uh, enzyme which is helping in conversion of dopamine to dopac so we are giving a maob inhibitors to stop this action so the drugs come coming under this maob inhibitors is selegilin and rasagilin next class of drug is comt inhibitors it, it is entacapone and tolcapone so you can see that comt inhibitors mainly in the peripheral circulation itself this l dopa will be converted into dopamine and also it is also converted into 3 o methyl dopa so this l dopa it is converted into two product one is dopamine as well as 3 o methyl dopa so what the comt inhibitors does is it is inhibiting that process it is inhibiting the conversion of l dopa to 3 o md in the peripheral circulation itself so thereby it will be increasing the levels of dopamine in the brain region okay so comt inhibitors uh, drugs coming under comt inhibitors is entacapone and tolcapone so usually we give l dopa for treating the parkinson's disease along with l dopa we are giving a peripheral decarboxylase inhibitors that is carbidofa carbidofa will be given to prevent the l dopa conversion in the peripheral circulation so along with this l dopa and carbidofa combination we can give either maob inhibitors or comt inhibitors we should not give l dopa 
MAOB as well as COMT because you are you are going to stop all the dopamine metabolism. So you should not do, uh, you should not give this combination. It is not a rational combination. So you can go for L-DOPA plus MAOB inhibitors or L-DOPA carbidopha along with COMT inhibitors. So next class of drugs is this uh, dopamine facilitator, which is amantadine. So amantadine is an antiviral drug. It is also used for treating the dyskinesis symptoms. So those patients who are not responding to L-DOPA, you can go for the amantadine class of drug. Next class of drug is this drugs affecting the cholinergic system. So I said that there is dyskinesias as well as tremors. Dyskinesias can be treated with the help of L-DOPA. But if you take tremors, it should be treated only with the anticholinergic drug. So you can go for central anticholinergic, that is trihexyphenidyl or bipyridin. So you can give this anticholinergic agents. Then you can go for antihistaminics like promethazine. So when you take a dopamine uh, receptors, you know that uh, uh, dopamine receptors, it is having both excitatory effect as well as inhibitory effect also. So you know you should know that dopamine, that is D1 and D5 is having the excitatory effect and D2 to D4 is having the inhibitory effect. So this is regarding the Parkinson's disease. Next class of disease, next disease is schizophrenia. So schizophrenia is nothing but a group of common major psychosis with a complex syndromal presentation. So it mainly affects the young adults showing chronic changes in behavior, perception, thoughts and emotion, causing a fundamental disorganization in personality and deterioration from previous levels of function. So it is coming under a psychiatric disorder. It is a complex syndrome, complex syndromal presentation means what? It is affecting behavior, perception, thoughts, emotion, etc. So it is a it is, it is constituting a number of symptoms. So it is a complex syndromal presentation coming under the psychiatric uh, disorder. So there are different types of schizophrenia. It is catatonic, disorganized type, paranoid, and residual as well as undifferentiated type. So catatonic type is nothing but it is affecting the voluntary muscular movement. So mainly it will be causing the immobility. In schizophrenia, two symptoms are pronounced. One is positive symptom, another one is negative symptoms. So positive symptoms means they'll be having hallucination and delusion. And if we take negative symptoms, means they'll be having the apath apathy, abolition. That is, they'll be uh, going for social withdrawal and all. So that is coming under negative symptoms. Two, two symptoms are more pronounced in schizophrenia. One is hallucination and delusion. Second thing is they'll be having this negative symptom, which is apathy and abolition. Okay, so in this uh, schizophrenia, there are different types. One is catatonic type. So in catatonic type, mostly it is characterized by immobility. That is, they'll be having uh, confusion, loss of, lack of muscular movement. So they'll be having problems in the muscular movement as well as uh, they'll be having they'll be in a confusion state. And also immobility will be seen. When you take disorganized, uh, disorganized type of uh, schizophrenia, it is mainly uh, dealing with the flat effect, that is speech disturbances. So disorganized type, they, they have the speech disturbance problem, they have a flat effect, that is they don't react at all. So all these are coming under disorganized type. Next is paranoid type. So here positive symptoms are more pronounced. Already I said positive symptom means it is including hallucination and delusion. So the uh, delusions are nothing but the disbelief. That is they have a feeling that that someone is going to harm them. That is the positive symptom. So in paranoid type, more positive symptoms will be pronounced. And if you take residual type, it is nothing but the recovery. Recovery phase of that uh, schizophrenia, we call it as the residual uh, type. So where the positive symptoms will start to disappear, that type of, uh, uh, during that stage, we call it as residual type. So these are different types and other classes will come under undifferentiated type. So these are different classes of, different types of schizophrenia. So these are the four dopamine pathways that is involved in uh, schizophrenia. So one is mesolimbic pathway, mesocortical pathway, nigrostriatal pathway, and fibrohypophysal pathway. So already said there are there are two symptoms. One is positive and negative symptoms. So how these positive symptoms are caused means you can see that mesolimbic pathway. First pathway is the mesolimbic pathway. So it is connecting from ventral tegmental area to the nucleus accumbens region. You can see that in the brain it is connecting the ventral tegmental area to the nucleus accumbens region. So here in this region there will be more increase in dopamine levels. So this increase in dopamine levels, it is causing the positive symptom, which is nothing but hallucination and delusion. Hallucination means what? They feel that some third person is there. Auditory hallucination, that is some third voice has been heard. Hallucinations and delusion means disbelief. So all these are the positive symptoms pronounced because of the mesolimbic pathway. So when you are concentrating on the mesocortical pathway, you can see that there will be dopamine hypoactivity. So in this pathway, in the second pathway, it is also starting from the ventral tegmental area, but it ends in the cortex region. 
as the name says mesocortical it starts from ventral tegmental area and ends in the cortex region so what happens here is there is lower levels of dopamine which is leading to the negative symptoms so it is a negative symptoms it is uh, affecting the cognitive and cognitive function of the patient negative symptoms means what they they go for a social withdrawal they don't mingle with the society properly they go into a depression they don't have uh, they have uh, they do uh, they have a lack of uh, effect they don't uh, do their activities properly so all these are coming under the negative symptoms so it is because of the dopamine hyperactivity in the mesocortical pathway when you take nigrostriatal pathway so you can see that nigrostriatal it starts from the substantia nigra region and ends up in the corpus striatum region so here the extra peripheral symptoms and tardive dyskinesia uh, uh, drug side effects are due to the nigrostriatal pathway only and next is tubero hypophysial pathway where there is increased secretion of prolactin hormone so when you are taking drugs when you are taking this antipsychotic drugs what happens there is side effects the side effects will be pronounced like uh, extra peripheral symptoms or tardive dyskinesia or hypo uh, prolactinemia all these symptoms are due to the nigrostriatal pathway abnormalities of dopamine in the nigrostriatal as well as the tubero hypophysial pathway so coming to the treatment of schizophrenia you know that uh, they are uh, treated with the help of typical antipsychotic and atypical antipsychotics so typical antipsychotics are the older and anti uh, older antipsychotics are the conventional antipsychotics and if you take atypical antipsychotics are the new generation antipsychotics so under the typical antipsychotics uh, you have different class of medicines ph phenothiazine butrophenone thiazanthines you can see that in the phenothiazine itself there are three different class aliphatic chain compounds that is chlorpromazine and triflu Promazine. Next is piperazine class, that is thiazine, and piperazine class you have flufenazine. In case of butrophenones, haloperidol. Haloperidol is the main uh, drug that is uh, com that comes under this butrophenones class, and broperidol, uh, this benperidol, and all it comes under butrophenones. Next is thiazanthine. So in the in that class you have the flufenthixone. So all these are coming under typical antipsychotics. Next class of drug is atypical antipsychotics, clozapine, olanzapine, risperidone, quetiapine, ziprazidone. All these are coming under the atyp atypical antipsychotics. These are the newer generation antipsy antipsychotics. So, what are the advantages of this new anti uh, newer generation antipsychotic? Is that it is devoid of the side effects. It is having very lesser side effects when compared to the typical antipsychotics. So, mainly this antipsychotic uh, drugs will be producing the extra peripheral symptoms, extra peripheral uh, symptoms, and tardive dis. Kinesia. So when you take this atypical antipsychotics, it is producing lesser extra peripheral symptoms when compared to the typical antipsychotics. So that is the advantage of using atypical antipsychotics. And also this at atypical antipsychotics, it will be blocking, selectively blocking the dopamine pathway. It doesn't block all the four pathways. You have seen that there are four pathways involved. Here, this atypical antipsychotic, it will be blocking this, it will be selectively blocking the dopamine pathway. When you take a, uh, typical antipsychotics, it doesn't block the dopamine pathways. Uh, it doesn't selectively block the dopamine pathways. So because of that, only you are getting all the positive, negative, that and uh, this ex extra pyramidal symptoms under. So next uh, important points to remember is neuroleptics like uh, this uh, pyridazine drug. So pyridazine is coming under the typical antipsychotic. It is also having a potent anti-emetic action. So most of this antipsychotic drug, you no, know, they have this anti-emetic effect. So next uh, disease is depression. So depression is a mood disorder that involves a pers uh, persistent feeling of sadness and loss of interest. So they have a always they have a feeling of sadness and they don't have any interest to do their activities. So it is different from mood fluctuation that people regularly experience as a part of life. So in, in our regular day-to-day uh, -day life, we have many problems and many mood fluctuations will be there. We go into depression, we'll be in a happy mood also. But this depression, it doesn't deal with the mood fluctuation. It is a mood disorder where they enter into a uh, full depressive state, uh, state where there is full uh, feeling of sadness as, as, as well as loss of interest. So uh, they'll be having some major uh, life events. They have they face some problems in their life events such as uh, bereavement or loss of a job and uh, that can lead to depression. That is, uh, uh, suppose loss of any family member or their fam uh, friends or loss of their job. So which is which is affecting that motive. Uh, uh, it, it is leading to the depression. So coming to the pathophysiology of depression, you can see that stress is the major cause for the depression. 
so stress it will be elevating the uh, it will be uh, leading to the abnormal elevation of the hormones as well as uh, it is also this, uh, causing abnormalities in the neurotransmitters so stress is uh, acting uh, it is causing the abnormalities in these neurotransmitters as well as the hormonal levels cortisol vasopressin aldosterone norepinephrine so all these things will be leading to the depression it is causing neurodegeneration as well as depression so stress is causing the abnormal hormonal imbalances as well as neurotransmitter imbalances which is leading to the depression problem so coming to the treatment of anti uh, 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 treatment of depression the class of drug is anti depressant drugs so you can you know that uh, mao uh, a inhibitors that is uh, moclobemide and uh, chlorigelin so all these are coming coming under mao inhibitor so it will be metabolizing mao a inhibitors it will metabolize all the uh, dopamine tyramine Uh, and all the neurotransmitters that is not acting as free. It will be uh, metabolizing these neurotransmitters. When you take MAOB inhibitors, it will be specifically metabolizing the dopamine neurotransmitter. So it may we will be using MAO inhibitors. Then tricyclic antidepressants: trimethamine, clo, uh, clomiphene, amitriptyline, nortriptyline, amoxifen. So all these are uh, the tricyclic antidepressants which will be inhibiting this norepinephrine as well as serotonin. reuptake it is inhibiting both norepinephrine as well as serotonin reuptake you can see that this uh, imipramine clomipramine and all are, are specifically they'll be uh, inhibiting the norepinephrine as well as serotonin they are coming under the uh, norepinephrine and serotonin reuptake inhibitors and if you see predominantly norepinephrine uh, reuptake inhibitors is nortriptyline desimipramine all these are norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors next class of drug is selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor so it will be selectively blocking the serotonin reuptake so fluoxetine pyroxetine sertraline citalopram all these are coming under ssri then you have snr a class of drug that is selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor so venlafaxin duloxetine all these are coming under snr so these are uh, treatment choice for the depression for treating depression we, we, we should uh, go for antidepressants next uh, disease is mania so mania is nothing but the alteration in the mood that is characterized by the extreme happiness extreme irritability hyperactivity little need for sleep and racing thoughts which might lead to rapid speech so they have, have they have the alteration in the alteration in their mood and they have the extreme happiness when you take depression they go in they have extreme feeling of sadness in case of mania what happens they are having extreme happiness extreme irritability agitation will be seen they have racing thoughts that is racing thoughts means uh, they have continuous thoughts uh, so which is leading to a very rapid speech so according to the symptoms mania can be classified into hypomania acute mania and delirious mania so if you take delirious mania it is a serious form of mania so what happens in uh, during that excitement they have a suicidal thought also that is delirious mania so it is a severe form of mania you can see that uh, how this uh, mania is caused so when the uh, events are uh, associated with the somatic effect like uh, certain drugs or uh, certain drugs withdrawal or any illness it can lead to insomnia that is sleep disturbances and events with psychic effects like separation loss or role change all these can cause anxiety grief and which is leading to insomnia that is sleep disturbance problems and events disturbing the uh, sleep schedules like uh, traveling or any uh, shift work so all these things also will cause insomnia so because of insomnia sleep disturbances they have the sleep reduction which is leading to mania condition you can see in the picture there is reduced need of sleep uh, sleep raising thoughts then they have inflated self esteem so all these are the features of the bipolar disorder that is mania in bipolar disorder you'll be having both mania as well as depression so treatment this will be giving the mood stabilizers so mainly will be going for carbamazepine uh, divalpyric sodium and lithium so mood stabilizers are given are the drug of choice for treating the mania condition you have to stabilize the mood because they are having a elevated mood and they have extreme happiness and extreme agitation so you have to give a mood stabilizing agent then you can also go for the antipsychotic drugs you can go for either, either first generation or second generation antipsychotics so in first generation antipsychotic most commonly used is haloperidol and clotrimazine when you take second generation antipsychotics you can go for olanzapine quetiapine risperidone ziprazidone 
so these are the things while uh, giving lithium carbonate at high dose it will increase the thirst and polyuria so you should remember that when you're giving a lithium uh, mood stabilizer at high dose it will be causing the thirst and polyuria problems and normal dose itself sometimes tremors can be felt with using the lithium and it is contraindicated in the six sinus syndrome so this six sinus syndrome is nothing that uh, it is uh, dealing with some heart problem where uh, there is a problem with the pacemaker and it is leading to the dysarrhythmia problem so when the patient is found to have some cardiac problems like uh, the six sinus syndrome this lithium is contraindicated so first line therapy is you are going to give monotherapy with lithium and uh, antipsychotic or valproate you can go for lithium or antipsychotic and valproate and combination therapy is you can give a lithium valproate plus antipsychotic agent so this is the first line treatment for uh, for the mania so in mania you have to go for mood stabilizers and antipsychotic drugs next uh, disease is stroke so stroke is nothing but the reduce or obstructed blood supply to the part of a brain so the brain needs sufficient oxygen nutrition for proper functioning so you know that uh, our brain requires sufficient oxygen and the nutrient supply so when there is obstruction to the blood flow to the brain you know that uh, that nutrients will not be supplied as well as the oxygen also will not be supplied to the brain so which is leading to hypoxia condition and so it will lead to stroke so it is also known as acute neurological deficit or the cerebrovascular incident so you know that two pairs of arteries are supplying the blood to the brain so first first pair is carotid artery it is a uh, right and left uh, cerebral artery supply front and mid brain so carotid artery is that is right and uh, left uh, uh, artery cerebral arteries they will be supplying the front and as well as the mid brain if you take the second pair it is a basilar artery it is uh, it is uh, supplying the vertebral uh, that is right and left vertebral artery and supplies the posterior part of the brain so these two arteries are involved in supplying the brain region front front and uh, mid brain as well as in the posterior lower part of the brain so when there is any reduce blood flow in these arteries mainly the carotid artery or in the basilar artery it can lead to stroke condition reduce blood supply or any obstruction in the arteries or any cardiac embolic uh, thrombus have been formed and it is dislodged and it is a uh, uh, including the carotid artery it will lead to stroke condition so there are different types of stroke one is ischemic stroke another one is hemorrhagic stroke you can see that the when there is obstruction to the blood supply to the brain you can see that in fact in the picture you can see that in fact is formed infarction in the brain is happening so it can lead to ischemic stroke as well as hemorrhagic stroke so the difference between ischemic and hemorrhagic is so when there is any bleeding in the brain uh, when there is any damage in the blood vessels it will be leading to bleeding condition that is hemorrhagic stroke ischemic stroke is reduce blood supply to the brain region and if you take treatment uh, for a uh, stroke you can go for the tissue plasminogen activator so mainly alteplase alteplase will be the drug of choice for treating the acute ischemic attack you can go for this uh, thrombolysis with the tissue plasminogen activator alteplase so this drug once you find that the patient is having a acute stroke immediately within 3 hours you have to uh, you have to start the thrombolysis procedure that too with the alteplase drug so after 3 hours you should not start with the alteplase you have you can go for the aspirin aspirin or the clopidogrel or dipyrimidone this drug of, uh, these drugs can be considered later in later stages on the first day they should be started only with the tissue plasminogen activity uh, activators that to within the 3 hours next uh, disease is hypertension so it is also known as the high blood pressure it is a long medic uh, long term medical condition in which blood pressure in the arteries is persistently elevated so there is a increase in the blood pressure you know that uh, when the systolic uh, blood pressure crosses above 140 uh, mm of mercury and diastolic blood pressure is more than 90 mm of mercury we call it as hypertension so according to jnc 8 guidelines this is a classification of hypertension so you classify into normal pre hypertension and uh, stage 1 hypertension and stage 2 hypertension you can know that normal bp is 120 by 80 in uh, in case of pre hypertension it will be ranging from 120 to 139 systolic bp and diastolic bp from 80 to 89 when you take a stage 1 hypertension the bp will be 140 to 159 as well as uh, 90 to 99 in case of diastolic bp and stage 2 hypertension there will be increase in 160 in systolic bp and greater than 100 in diastolic bp so this is the jnc uh, guidelines eight guidelines 
and you can see that uh, patho pathophysiology of hypertension mainly it is due to the defects in the renal uh, renal uh, sodium hemostatus when there is abnormalities in the sodium levels in the renal in the kidneys uh, and also functional vasoconstriction when there is excessive vasoconstriction or any defects in vascular smooth muscle growth and structure so all these will lead to sodium and water retention it is leading to inadequate sodium excretion sodium and water retention and thereby it is increasing the blood pressure it will be activating the tras pathway renin angiotensin aldosterone pathway and thereby it increases the blood pressure so the drug of choice for uh, treating the uh, hypertension is diuretics so you can go for thyroid diuretics hydrochlorothiazide uh, chlorotriazide indapamide then high ceiling that loop diuretics furosemide potassium sulfide the diuretics uh, spinal lactone so all diuretics is the a drug of choice for treating the hypertension next is ac inhibitors you can go for enalpril ramipril captopril fosinopril lisinopril all these are the ac inhibitors and arb blockers you can go for losartan ibisartan valsartan all these drugs then calcium channel blockers you can go for uh, non dihydropyridines verapamil and diltiazem and dihydropyridines uh, 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 you can go for nifedipine amlodipine and all next is beta blockers you can go for uh, propanolol metoprolol then both uh, that is a uh, beta and alpha adrenergic blockers you can go for carvedilol then alpha adrenergic blockers prazosin terazosin then central sympathetic you can go for uh, clonidin drug then vasodilators hydrolysis hydrolysin minoxidil then uh, sodium nitroprusside so all these drugs can be given for treating the hypertension next is angina so it is a disease marked by the sudden brief attacks of the chest pain or discomfort caused by the deficient oxygenation of the heart muscles due to impaired blood flow to the heart so when there is impairment in the blood flow to the heart that is reduced blood flow to the heart it will be leading to a chest pain condition the pain will be felt in the uh, chest region we call it as angina angina pectoris so there are different types of angina stable angina and unstable angina so stable angina is felt during any physical activities when when the person is doing any physical activities like exercise or any physical exertion or he is doing his work he is getting that uh, chest pain means it is called as the stable angina unstable angina means it is a uh, it is due to the reduced blood supply to the heart it, that it is uh, because there is any uh, clot in the arteries uh, supplying the heart region so this will lead to the unstable angina next is prince metal angina prince metal angina or the variant angina so it occurs during uh, mostly during the night time as well as in the early morning period so these are different types of angina stable unstable and prince metal angina so stable angina is due to the physical activity or physical exertion unstable angina is it is related to the reduced blood supply to the heart and uh, prince metal is due mostly or occurs that is sudden vasospasm will happen sudden vasospasm will happen and it will be uh, chest pain will be caused during the night time or in the early morning that is prince metal angina and it is a very rare form of angina coming to the myocardial infarction so it is a disease condition which is characterized by the reduced flow, flow in the coronary artery due to atherosclerosis and occlusion of artery by the embolus or a thrombus so here also there will be reduced blood supply to the heart you know that coronary artery is the artery that supplies the heart muscles so when there is any obstruction to the blood flow in coronary artery it will be that is because of any embolus or thrombus formation it will lead to myocardial infarction infarction means cell death so myocardial it will be leading to the cell death of the uh, myocardial cells so you can see that uh, thrombus and emboli so thrombus is nothing but the clot formation it is a permanent clot and if you take a emboli this clot is getting detached and it is traveling to the other parts of the body that is embolus so it may be this uh, reduced blood supply may be due to the thrombus or the embolus formation so you know that uh, uh, for uh, this angina and myocardial main thing is atherosclerosis there will be accumulation of the plaques uh, lipid plaques and this is leading to the ischemia condition that is because of this uh, atherosclerosis uh, plaque formation there will be formation of deposition of the lipids and there will be formation of the atherosclerotic plaques so because of this accumulation of the uh, plaques what happens it is leading to the ischemia condition that is reduced blood supply to the heart and it is leading to the hypoxia condition that is reduced oxygen supply to the heart so because of this there is a oxygen demand so during that condition we experience the angina 
and it is also leading to the permanent cell death which is myocardial infarction we call it as heart attack so the other name for myocardial infarction is heart attack generally we term it as heart attack so drug of choice for treating this angina and myocardial infarction is will be going for the nitrates so uh, mostly we'll be giving that nitrate glycerol trinitrate this isosorbate dinitrate isosorbate mononitrate mostly it is given in the sublingual route isosorbate dinitrate, uh, dinitrate is given in the sublingual route to avoid this uh, whenever a patient is experiencing this myocardial infarction we'll be going for the isosorbate dinitrate in the sublingual route then beta blockers can be given propanolol metoprolol atenolol then calcium channel blockers you can go for calcium channel blockers same dihydropyridines can be given then potassium channel openers nicorandel then other drugs you can go for this uh, trimetazidine and all trimetazidine now uh, most commonly used anti anginal drug next uh, disease is acute renal failure so it is a condition which kidneys can't filter waste from the body so uh, suddenly the kidneys doesn't function properly you know that functions of kidneys is it is a main function is excretion of the waste products not only excretion it also maintains the blood pressure it also helps in uh, production of erythropoietin hormone thereby it regulates the uh, hemoglobin levels and all so once the kidney is getting uh, kidney function is getting declined it is not able to filter the waste from the blood so this acute renal failure develops rapidly over a few hours or days so it may be fatal it's more most common in those uh, critically ill and already hospitalized patient so you know that the difference between acute and renal failure is this acute is reversible condition once you treat that uh, disease it is a reversible condition you find out the exact etiology then you can treat the disease in case of chronic renal failure it is a chronic progressive loss of kidney function it might be due to uh, diabetes or any metabolic disorder or hypertension or any problems which is causing the pro uh, chronic progressive loss of the kidney function so that is a major difference between the acute and chronic renal failure so acute is a reversible condition and chronic is a irreversible condition so there are uh, three main causes for the acute renal failure pre renal causes intrinsic renal cause as well as post renal causes so when there is any uh, decreased uh, blood supply to the kidneys uh, pre renal causes means mainly it is dealing with the uh, bl uh, blood supply to the kidneys so when there is decreased blood supply to the kidneys any obstruction any uh, stenosis condition in the blood supply so it be leading to the pre renal causes if you take intrinsic causes means any damage in the structure within the kidney it will be uh, it, it is coming under the intrinsic causes and post renal is when there is obstruction in the ureters or in the urinary bladder it is coming under the post renal causes so when you take acute renal failure three causes are there pre renal intrinsic damage and post renal causes so all these will lead to acute renal failure so mainly the treatment of choice for acute renal failure is diuretics so here uh, acute renal failure they'll be having this uh, oliguria condition they'll be having a reduced uh, uh, urine output so the uh, first first line uh, drug of choice will be the diuretics and only choice of drug for treating arf is you have to go for diuretics so you can go for uh, this high efficacy diuretics pirosemide or torazemide and medium efficacy diuretic is uh, thiazide diuretics then weak diuretics is you can go for carbonic anhydrase inhibitors acetazolamide potassium sparing diuretics as spinal lactone and uh, this uh, triamterin or amiloride and osmotic diuretics are also there uh, glycerol mannitol next is chronic renal failure so i said that it is a chronic progressive loss of kidney function so uh, main function of kidney is it is to excrete and also it is helping in electrolyte balance and also secretion of production of certain hormones erythropoietin renin prostaglandins active form of vitamin d so all these hormones are produced from the kidneys so when there is any damage to the kidneys it will be affecting the excretion it will be also affecting it will be also affecting the uh, electrolyte balance in the body and also there will be deficiency in production of these hormones erythropoietin renin prostaglandin and active form of vitamin d so here the creatinine clearance there will be a, a decrease in the creatinine clearance 
in case of uh, mild it will be from 50 to 80 milliliter per minute in case of moderate creatinine clearance it is 30 to 50 milliliter per minute and in case of severe uh, creatinine clearance problems it, the, it, it reaches 15 to 30 milliliter per minute so the only uh, treatment choice for chronic renal failure is you can go for symptomatic management you can see what are the symptoms present and based upon the symptoms you can go for symptomatic management and there is no proper cure for uh, chronic renal failure you have to go for the continuous replacement therapy only that is they have to go for either dialysis or they have to go for the per permanent renal transplantation so that is the treatment choice for chronic renal failure So here uh, in uh, chronic renal failure, there will be decrease in the glomerular filtration rate, decrease in the urine output, and it cause, also causes some systemic complication. So the normal GFR rate is 120 milliliter per minute. So here the GFR rate will go below 50 milliliter per minute. In case of uh, stage 5, there are different stages in chronic renal failure, stage 1 to stage 5. In stage 5, it, uh, the GFR rate is go, going below 50 milliliter per minute. So at this condition, can, uh, they have to go for the renal transplantation or dialysis is the only option for treatment of CKD. So uh, I said about symptomatic management in chronic renal failure. So they'll be having hypertension. So they'll be having uh, because of the activation of the RAS pathway. Since they are having hypovolemia condition in the body, there will be activation of the RAS pathway and this will increase their blood pressure. So we have to give a drug that will be reducing the blood pressure. So you have to go for AC inhibitors or the ARBs. So this is a drug of choice for the renal failure patient. Whenever you are choosing, there are many classes of antihypertensive, but the recommended drug for treating uh, uh, this renal failure is you have to go for AC inhibitors or ARBs. So if you're not uh, finding fruitful with AC or ARB, then you can go for calcium channel blockers. And, and I already said that they'll be having anemia condition because erythropoietin is secreted from the kidneys. So when there is kidney function decline, there will be the, these patients surely will be having anemia condition. So there is decrease in the RBC level. So you have to give erythropoietin injection to treat that anemia or you can go for the ferrous supplements. Either ferrous supplements or injection erythropoietin depending upon the HB levels. Then they also have this metabolic acidosis problem because uh, electrolyte imbalance is uh, felt in the patient. So they, they have to be treated with the calcium gluconate or sodium bicarbonate. And apart from that, they, they have to go for the phosphate binders also. They'll be treated with phosphate binders because they have the secondary hyperparathyroidism problems. That is, uh, this active form of vitamin D is not produced from the kidneys. So it is leading to the abnormal activation of this parathyroid hormone. That is, uh, increased action of the parathyroid hormone. And it will be leading to the calcium and phosphorus imbalance. So we are going to give a drug. Phosphate binders will be given to the kidney failure patient. So treating hypertension, treat the anemia, treat hyperkalemia or metabolic acidosis, and treat the secondary hyperparathyroidism in the kidney failure patient. So these are symptomatic management done in the kidney failure patient. So there is no proper treatment. Only we have to go for the symptomatic management. Final permanent cure is you have to go for dialysis or the renal replacement therapies. You have to go for the transplantation. So these are the questions, uh, some of the questions asked in the uh, GPAT exam, last GPAT exam. So the correct uh, statement about vitamin D. So vitamin D, they have asked a question, in which condition it has been used. So you know that there is uh, less production of active form of vitamin D in the kidney failure. So mostly it is used in the chronic renal failure. The oral administration of this vitamin D is required in the chronic renal failure condition. So next question is, which of the following will result, result in very closest value to the GFR rate? So apart from GFR, we used to diagnose this uh, acute renal failure and chronic renal, renal failure with the glomerular filtration rate only. So apart from that, we can use even creatinine clearance. Creatinine is the muscular breakdown product. Uh, it is a breakdown product of the muscles. So it is of no use. This creatinine is of no use. And uh, once there is kidney dysfunction, what happens? This creatinine is not excreted and it is getting accumulated in the body. So uh, how much amount of creatinine is getting accumulated in the body? By uh, that is That will be measured as the creatinine clearance rate. So it is almost equivalent to the GFR rate and it is a uh, closest value to the GFR rate. So you can use creatinine clearance to assess the uh, kidney function. 
next in uh, which uh, in the transplant rejection the clinical features of graft versus host reaction includes dermatitis diarrhea fever weight loss intestinal malabsorption and rheumatoid arthritis so they have asked these option so you know that in uh, uh, ckd they have to go for a final thing is they have to go for a renal transplantation so in renal after doing the renal transplantation there are high chance of getting a graft rejection because you are going to keep a new organ into the body so what will happen ultimately there will be antibody formation and there will be graft rejection so during that graft rejection they are asking what are the clinical features you can find out so there will be dermatitis allergic reaction allergic reaction can happen diarrhea will be there fever weight loss malabsorption problems will be there but arthritis symptoms will not be there so they have asked which of the features are not seen in the graft versus host reaction next is which one of the following is a organ specific autoimmune disease they have asked so also uh, organ specific autoimmune diseases there are many autoimmune diseases sir graves disease addison's disease diabetes type 1 diabetes so all these are coming under the autoimmune disease the rheumatoid arthritis and all so organ specific is graves uh, in in that category graves disease comes because it is specifically affecting the thyroid glands so they are asking which is the uh, following organ specific auto autoimmune disease so we can go for the graves disease because it is affecting the thyroid gland then they are asking next question is one of the following is not a chemical or a histochemical change that occurs in the infection of heart so there will be no decrease in the sodium then which one of the following is not a renal osteodystrophy exact uh, option is secondary hypoparathyroidism already i said in ckd there will be hyperparathyroidism that is increase in parathyroid hormone secretion but the option given here is hypoparathyroidism so this option will show this question any other clar clarifications thank you so much madam uh, participants if you have any queries you can uh, raise your hands and you can ask directly to the speaker or you can text the uh, queries in the chat, chat box sir i have covered only few diseases i didn't cover all the diseases sir. if I, next class if it is possible i'll, I'll try to complete other diseases no issues madam hello pratnam thank you Thank you. Thank you for elaborate, ma'am. But uh, your PPT also very good. Initially, you shared, sir. You shared, Arunan, sir. You shared your PPT. Thank you.